Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. <coughs> Welcome back. We're almost at the halfway mark for this series of talks, so if you've, if you've made it this far, uh, the, uh, the downhill slope is within sight. And uh, I'm happy to say that I, I believe my voice has made a, a slight recovery so that I, uh, I'm optimistic about being able to uh, continue to the end myself. Uh, I want to uh, point out that I, ha I do have visual aids for uh, this talk, but I'm afraid I, I had no good place to put them, so I've uh, displayed them here at the, uh, in the gutter of the whiteboard. Uh, these, are, these are genuine miniature replicas <laughs> of World War I uh, posters, uh, which... Uh, which uh, constituted a, a, a remarkable uh, and extraordinarily colorful art form. And uh, I, I believe that uh, you can actually find collections of these uh, online uh, if you'd ever like to look at some of them. They're, uh, they're memorable in various ways, not only for the artistry, but uh, for the kinds of sentiment expressed in them and the uh, the themes that uh, the artists decided to use uh, as their uh, points of emphasis, many of them had to do with exhorting people to lend money to the government by buying government bonds. Uh, but they cover a vast range of other topics from, uh, from canning fruits and vegetables for conservation purposes to... Uh, to sending your sons off to uh, to die at the front, so <laughs> so there's a little little bit of everything so far as the government's war program was concerned that uh, that the artists decided to uh, join in promoting, and uh, these these uh, posters are really quite astonishing. This uh, this little one in the middle uh, was something that that you could. Uh, place in the window of your home or apartment to signify to your neighbors that you indeed had bought uh, some bonds in the government's fourth Liberty Loan drive. And uh, it was important during the war that you let your neighbors know that you were not a slacker because uh, millions of them were looking for slackers and uh, they were intent on exposing them and seeing that they were at least ridiculed and, uh, if need be, lynched. So uh, it was a, an amazing time in this country. I, I'm not sure there was ever anything like it uh, in terms of the degree to which war hysteria swept up so many people uh, in such a violent way. And one is left to ponder, what, what was it about these people that made them capable of suddenly becoming that way? Uh, you might not have suspected uh, before the war began that uh, Americans were capable of behaving that way, and yet clearly they were. So they must have had some kind of uh, pent-up hostility, uh, longing for an outlet, at least a great many of them. I want to call your attention to an essay by Murray Rothbard, which I'm sure some of you know about already. It's called World War I as Fulfillment. Uh, subtitle is Power and the Intellectuals. And uh, this is a, a long essay. Uh, it was published in the uh, Journal of Libertarian Studies uh, in uh, 1989. And... Uh, appears again in the volume uh, John Denson edited uh, called uh, The Costs of War. And uh, this, this is a, a, a wonderful essay to read uh, just for enjoyment. I mean, if it, I think everybody likes reading Murray Rothbard. It's so much fun because he's just so full of in, in, information and, and uh, white hot argument. Uh, and uh, and writes so well. Uh, Murray was a tremendous stylist, uh, a master uh, 
of using simple, straightforward prose in an extremely effective way. And uh, this, this essay, I think, is, uh, is Murray at his best. But very pertinent to my topic this morning, World War I, uh, because it, uh, it uh, fills in, in fact, it was explicitly uh, designed to fill in what he described as, a, as an omission from my own discussion of World War I in my book, Crisis and Leviathan. And uh, I'm actually proud that I had something to do with this essay because it was written for a conference uh, held in 1986 uh, at which a draft of my book, Crisis and Leviathan, was the topic. And uh, uh, a number of outstanding scholars agreed to attend that conference and even to write papers uh, having something to do with, with, with an assigned part of my uh, manuscript. And uh, so Murray was assigned to, to write in relation to World War I, and this is the essay he presented. And uh, so I'm uh, honored that I had any connection whatsoever with it, and I commend it to you. Murray's essay uh, argues that uh, despite what historians have often claimed, usually claimed, uh, which is that uh, World War I killed progressivism, and most of them weep for that, <laughs> uh, Murray argues that uh, indeed World War I was the culmination of progressivism and that uh, it gave progressive intellectuals in particular opportunities to realize various objectives uh, that they had been unable to realize uh, uh, previously, that wartime conditions, uh, uh, far from killing this kind of liberal program they were espousing, liberal now in the modern sense, modern American sense, uh, it actually uh, opened up vast opportunities for these post-millennial pietists to, uh, to impose on the public uh, government policies such as prohibition uh, of uh, production and sale of uh, alcoholic beverages uh, that they'd been unable to impose on society before. Uh, but not just that, many other uh, policies as well. And, and uh, so in that, in that sense, I think Murray argues correctly that World War I was not the end of progressivism, but the culmination of it. And if, if, if it ever did end, it was only after the war. Now, there's another uh, set of events, a couple of events I want to mention before uh, getting into the war years themselves, uh, because I think they too need to be seen as, on the one hand, culminations of the progressive program at the national level and uh, essential preconditions for the government's actions during World War I. So they're, they're uh, critical parts of both progressivism and war socialism. And, and those two events are uh, the creation of the Fed, the Federal Reserve System, uh, and uh, the ratification of the 16th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, uh, followed immediately by passage of uh, income tax legislation by Congress uh, in late 1913. So. Um, uh, I, I think for lovers of liberty, uh, 1913 ranks as one of the all-time bad years because we got the Fed and the income tax uh, put in place uh, in the same year. And uh, those two institutions uh, have proven to be uh, monumental contributors to the growth of government and the corresponding loss of liberty in this country. Uh, over the past 90 years. Um, the, the, the income tax had uh, a long history, of course. Uh, you'll recall that an income tax was imposed during the war between the states. Uh, 
uh, became an important uh, source of revenue for the Union government uh, and was carried on for a number of years after the war, finally discontinued in 1872. Uh, but another income tax was passed in the 1890s. Uh, indeed, the Democrats uh, always proposed income tax bills in the late 19th century. Every session of Congress, they introduced an income tax bill. Uh, but when one was actually uh, passed uh, in uh, 1894, uh, it, it provided for a, a small flat rate tax on incomes above a, a fairly uh, high uh, limit so that it wouldn't have affected the great mass of people in any event. Uh, but the Supreme Court, of course, declared that law unconstitutional in 1895. So uh, that was a very transitory revival of the income tax, but once again, its proponents didn't quit, and they kept introducing income tax legislation every year. Uh, they, were, they were seeking, they claimed, uh, to provide some offset or some justice, as it were, uh, for the working classes uh, who were bearing the brunt of federal taxation uh, because uh, the tariff was the major source of, of federal revenue, and of course, everybody who consumed directly or indirectly imported goods was paying that tax. And, uh, and in a sense, even people who, who might not have imported, uh, consumed imported goods were paying it too, uh, because the, the tariff pro provided uh, protection from competition which allowed some domestic sellers to sell at higher prices than otherwise, and so those higher prices can be viewed as a kind of tax in their own right. Now, now that, that aspect was, was well understood and argued by the Democratic Party in the late 19th century, or in the entire 19th century, indeed. Uh, it was a major uh, argument against high tariffs, and, uh, and, and so the idea of the Democrats was always that, uh, that the rich are escaping because we have this consumption tax on imported goods, uh, which is being borne by the masses, and we need to add at least a, 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 a class tax to this mass tax. The class tax being 19th century lingo for, for one that would bear on, on, on high-income people, wealthy people, and uh, the idea had always been, at least the claim had always been, that income taxes would never be applied to the great mass of people. This was a form of tax aimed at the rich. Well, finally, uh, the, 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 they, they brought this issue to, in, into sufficient political prominence during uh, uh, the first decade of the 20th century, that even the old guard Republicans concluded that they couldn't just ignore it and expect to defeat it forever. They had to resort to strategy. And so uh, Senator uh, uh, from Rhode Island, um, Aldrich, the leader of the Republican Old Guard, uh, came up with a scheme. Uh, one was to levy a corporation tax, and this was a flat rate 2% tax on corporate income over $5,000. So once again, this wouldn't have affected very many people directly, and it wasn't very big anyhow. Certainly by our standards, 2% seems almost negligible. Uh, and Aldrich imagined, in fact, he, he publicly admitted that what he hoped to do by proposing the corporation tax was to, to placate the public that indeed the rich were being punished in this fashion and that would divert their attention <laughs> and passion away from a general income tax. But... Uh, to pretend to be fair at the same time, he introduced a, a, a bill in Congress which gained passage uh, in 1909 uh, providing for an amendment to the Constitution which would permit 
taxation of incomes and therefore get around the Supreme Court's uh, Pollock decision in 1895 declaring income taxes uh, unconstitutional because they weren't uh, apportioned according to population as the Constitution requires all the direct taxes to be. So this was a scheme and one it didn't work because Aldrich never thought that uh, this proposed amendment would gain ratification. Uh, but within just four years, it, it had passed around enough state legislatures to, <laughs> to get the required number of approvals, and indeed it was ratified in 1913. And as soon as it got uh, the ratification, uh, President Wilson convened a, a special session of Congress uh, for the purpose of of uh, passing new uh, tax legislation, and they uh, they did late in 1913 uh, enact a law lowering tariff rates and imposing an income tax. Now, unlike the uh, the income tax of of 1895 at the flat two percent rate, this one was a graduated rate tax. Started at one percent, but it was a class tax. Uh, the, the lowest uh, income affected by this 1% rate was $20,000. And in 1913, that was a, a very large income. So uh, a mere handful of, of Americans earned more than $20,000 a year in 1913, uh, cert certainly no more than 1% or 2%. And uh, so it looked as if, indeed, it, it, it touched only the very rich and e even they, to start with, had to pay only 1% marginal rates. So, again, negligible. It's, it's almost a token, right? Beware of tokens. Tokens often amount to feet in the door. <laughs> and this was the best case of foot in the door I could ever imagine in American history. Uh, the rates uh, ran up from the 1% uh, up to a rate of maximum 7%. And that, uh, that was on an income of, uh, I believe, a million dollars, if I recall correctly. There's a table in my book. 1%, uh, uh, you had to have an, a, an income of $500,000. <laughs> I, got, I suppose that was pretty much it. Rockefeller and Morgan. <laughs> I don't know if uh, there were more than a half a dozen Americans who had incomes of more than ha half a million dollars a year in 1913. So, so this looked uh, this looked like a definite token tax on the rich. But all we have to do is move forward to 1917 and 18, and we see that during the war. Uh, the government's quest for revenue uh, led Congress to alter the tax so that, uh, on the one hand, the, the bottom rate uh, was raised from that 1% to 6%, <laughs> and the bracket to which it applied was shoved way down so that instead of uh, having to start paying tax uh, on income over 20000 it now became, in 1917, income over 2,000. Uh, and that, that swept a, the entire middle class into tax liability. Uh, and the top rate was pushed from the 7% it started at to 77%, a near confiscatory rate uh, applicable to incomes of a million dollars or more. Now, uh, you may recall that after the war, uh, the tax rates were lowered under Secretary of the Treasury Mellon's leadership, but never lowered anywhere near the pre-war uh, rates. So that despite a series of tax rate reductions in the 1920s, the war brought about a, uh, an enduring increase in the magnitude and incidence of income taxation by the federal government. And, uh, of course, it was a major source of revenue to the government to pay for uh, its war program. Now, I've put a little uh, diagram uh, scheme up here 
uh, to organize uh, our thinking about what the government was doing during the war. Uh, the basic economic problem of, uh, of a government that goes to war, uh, if, if, if it's an, a war of any uh, substantial size, is that it suddenly needs to get command of more resources than, than, it, than it currently commands. Now, it's got to divert goods and services from the uses they would otherwise serve, uh, civilian uses uh, for consumption and investment purposes, and to, to, to production of military goods and services. So how can it make that uh, reallocation of resources? Well, ordinarily, uh, what we uh, see the government doing to, to reallocate resources is, is getting money somehow from people, usually by taxing it away from them, and then using that money to purchase uh, on markets uh, what, it, what it wants to use. Uh, normally, uh, most of what the government uh, uses, it pays for, uh, at least formally. So the question is, uh, to get money, you can, you can tax. As I mentioned yesterday, one way you can tax without appearing to tax is by inflating the money stock. And uh, if the inflation is, uh, is designed so that it gives uh, first or early use of the newly created money to the government itself, uh, and invariably it is so designed, uh, sometimes because the government just prints the money, uh, as the Union did when it printed the greenbacks during the Civil War, or sometimes because the government works through the banking system to, to make uh, newly created deposits uh, available to itself, either at the first or the second round, uh, the government gets early use of the new money and therefore is able to spend it for goods and services uh, before it is fully depreciated, which it, it, it becomes as it passes uh, through the economy uh, with a succession of purchases and repurchases. So taxation can be direct or it can be by, by means of uh, inflation. Uh, and during wartime, uh, nearly every uh, government war program has relied quite heavily on inflation, at least to some extent. And during World War I, the government relied quite heavily. Between 1914 and 1920, uh, the, the, the money stock of the United States approximately doubled. And uh, as, a, as a strict quantity theorist would have forecasted, uh, voila! Uh, the average price level of the country approximately doubled, too. Uh, so uh, it was a very straightforward inflationary episode, but if we look at how it operated and wh where the money went, we see that uh, a great deal of it went uh, to help the government finance, uh, directly or indirectly, purchases of war materials. So that's taxation. Now, uh, people don't like to be taxed, and when government makes taxes uh, higher and, and expands the incidence of taxation during warfare, you make even more people unhappy, uh, and so that pre presents a constraint to what the government is trying to do. If you tax people too heavily, they'll decide that this is just more burdensome uh, adventure than, than they care to, to, to tolerate. Governments all understand that. And so uh, they like to, if they can, uh, uh, somehow carry out their wars without making people aware <laughs> of just how burdensome they really are. Now, the inflation tax is, is one good way to do that, partly because most people can be fooled into thinking that the inflation is something like an act of God. It either just happens, you know, where'd that come from? Or, uh, or, or it's something caused by evil capitalists. After all, it's the, it's the storekeeper that keeps raising his prices, isn't it? He must be causing the inflation. So this, uh, this way of, uh, of uh, diverting the public's attention from, from the true workings of in, in inflation uh, can be counted on to, 
to keep people somewhat placated. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, all governments try to borrow money to pay for their big wars, and uh, about two-thirds of the government's expenses of World War I were covered with revenues obtained by borrowing. And that's where these liberty loan drives came into play. Uh, the government had uh, a series of big uh, bond sales, uh, and they called their bonds uh, liberty bonds, of course, because during the war they called everything liberty. Uh, uh, this was uh, a, a beautiful uh, example of Orwellianism in action, as governments at war always are. Uh, they always call things the exact opposite of what they are, uh, as in the term peacekeepers, you know, those being armed men who go about killing people in foreign lands uh, and so forth. Uh, but uh, the, these bond drives uh, uh, allowed the government to get uh, its hands on uh, eventually some uh, $25 billion uh, in new, new revenue uh, to, to go toward paying for the war. And uh, that was no small sum. In those days, the, the gross national product was in the neighborhood of... Uh, Oh, about seventy billion dollars a year. So this was a very large amount of borrowing the government was undertaking at the time. I want to remember that this whole episode we're talking about American involvement in World War One uh, extended over only about nineteen months. You know, the war in Europe had gone on for years before the United States declaration of war. So uh, this country was a very late entrant. And uh, a lot of things happened in 19 months. This was a, a, a feverish time for government action. Now, if the government's going to borrow money, it, it may find very easily that, that the only way it can borrow large sums is by offering uh, those people who lend to it higher rates of interest. Otherwise, what, I mean, what is the inducement for them to change their current behavior if they're already allocating their savings in optimal ways, and why should they change? The government comes into the market, and it's got to bid uh, loanable funds away from others who seek uh, to borrow those funds. So it does that in an open market by offering a higher interest rate. Well, the government doesn't want to do that. It doesn't want to offer a higher interest rate, because that, again, uh, has to uh, has to be covered somewhere uh, by tax revenues later, if not sooner. So to prevent its costs from from mounting uh, because the costs of servicing that debt uh, uh, become enormous, as they would have if the government had openly openly bid against others uh, in the uh, in the loan market, it can make life a lot easier if it can somehow find a way to increase the demand for its securities artificially. And it does that, again, through inflation. If the Federal Reserve System uh, takes measures to, to pump bank reserves into the commercial banking system, then all these banks find themselves flush with reserves, and they look around for ways to lend or invest the money. And one of the options that banks invariably consider in this country is a purchase of government securities. So now we've got a perfect uh, meeting of the methods here. Banks get, are flush with r reserves. They're, they're looking to invest in a secure way. And, uh, and the government is, is wanting to borrow money. Yeah, what, a, what a nice match. So... During World War I, the banks either themselves purchased government securities, and indeed the Fed changed the regulations with regard to bank purchase of government bonds to encourage them to, to purchase them directly, or, again, uh, they can lend the money to, to individuals and firms who themselves then have the means to invest in government bonds. And so... In, in, in various ways, inflating the, the money stock through, through the operation of the Fed, uh, 
uh, acts to make borrowing easier by increasing the demand and holding down the increase in interest rates that otherwise would occur. Uh, so inflation is operating through that avenue as well. And, and finally, if, if just uh, paying for uh, goods and services is not getting the job done, and uh, for some purposes it never does, uh, then the government has a, a third option, which is just go take what it wants. And uh, it, can, it can take it directly, as it were, at gunpoint. It can force people uh, by just passing uh, laws authorizing it to confiscate your goods or services. Uh, the most important resource we're talking about here is, is human labor and life because uh, m most people don't want to sell those resources except at a very high rate. And, of course, if the government had to pay market rates to get young men to, to serve as cannon fodder in the trenches of France, the cost would have been enormous. But if it can just compel them uh, by threatening to put them in prison uh, if they don't join the army, uh, then it can acquire... A soldier's services, cheap. Indeed, a private only, uh, only earned about $30 a month during World War I. That, that, that wasn't even what a common laborer in agriculture made in those days. So uh, virtually token payment was being made to ordinary uh, soldiers. And uh, of, of the 4 million people who were ultimately a part of the U.S. Army by the end of the war, uh, 2.8 million of them were conscripts. So some 70% of, of all the people who served in the Army in World War I uh, were drafted. And, uh, of course, some of those who voluntarily uh, enlisted have to be understood as having done so in order to avoid being drafted. <laughs> Because on some occasions, one can get a better deal by joining uh, than by uh, waiting and being drafted a, a better assignment of duty. Uh, in addition, uh, almost 700,000 uh, men served in the Navy, and some of those also need to be understood as having joined the Navy in order to avoid being drafted into the Army. Uh, the worst fate of a draftee, of course, is that he'll end up in the infantry. And nobody wants to be there, because even if you don't get blown to smithereens, uh, and, and the chances of that were quite considerable in World War I, uh, it, it's extraordinarily unpleasant to live outdoors in the rain and the cold and the heat and the mud and the excrement and the rats and all the rest of it. If you've read, read about conditions in the trenches in World War I, it's just horrifying just to be there. Not to speak of the fact that people are under bombardment much of the time, living in terror that they're going to be killed or gassed. So um, $30 a month wouldn't do the job. And so they just took these men and forced them to perform the service. Uh, now, while doing it, they glorified it because they hoped that would ease the skids. They hoped that if you provided enough patriotic hoopla surrounding uh, the induction of men into the armed forces, that that would begin to, 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 to make them feel a little better about it and uh, diminish the degree of resistance that they or their friends and relatives and neighbors might otherwise put up. And so the Wilson administration, when it began the draft, uh, carefully prepared uh, hoopla all over the country so that uh, newspaper editors and local committees all joined forces in, in, in trying to glorify what was being done by conscripting these men. Uh, and uh, some people had expected a great deal of resistance. Indeed, when the draft law was being debated in Congress, some members of the of Congress forecast that there would be blood in the streets, that there would be draft riots, again, as there had been during the war between the states. Uh, 
but there were none. Uh, and, I, and I think there, there were uh, at least two important reasons why they didn't uh, happen. Uh, maybe three, actually, the third one being that a considerable number of people just evaded the draft in World War I. They, they never registered, or if they did register, they didn't show up when called. So the evasion rate was, uh, as I remember, about 10 or 11 percent. But uh, aside from that and the hoopla, the Army had learned something from the experience of draft resistance in the 1860s. In those days, the draft was enforced by the Army itself. So if you were called to report and you didn't show up, some soldiers appeared at your door, armed, and dragged you off. Well, that's crude. <laughs> that's too blatant. That makes it too obvious what's being done. So, in 1917, the Army had developed a system for operating the draft, which took the Army itself out of visibility for running the draft. Civilian draft boards were created in districts, small districts, that covered the whole country. Civilian volunteers from those neighborhoods were recruited to serve as members of the draft boards. They had to comply with general uh, regulations uh, concerning uh, qualifications for the draft and what have you, but nonetheless, uh, they had considerable discretion within the bounds of the general guidelines in deciding which specific individuals they would draft uh, from the number they were given as their quota. That, that meant uh, several things. It, it meant, first of all, that whatever kinds of local prejudices happened to exist in that draft district were likely to be reflected in the operation of the draft uh, so that uh, it, it, if you had uh, a, a draft in places where people hated the Irish, then they'd probably draft a lot of Irish guys before they drafted others. Uh, there were many claims made that in, in uh, many draft districts in the South, blacks were, were, were treated shabbily, and that's easy to believe in the time and place. Uh, but all sorts of prejudices might be indulged when you put this sort of power in the hands of, 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 of people with discretion. Uh, uh, at the same time, uh, this system uh, made it look as if, well, this was just all community defense effort. You know, it was Mrs. Jones and Mr. Smith who were selecting you to defend the neighborhood. It wasn't the president or the, or the, uh, the army leadership in Washington, D.C. It, you know, it wasn't even uh, armed men at all. It was just your your neighbors and civic leaders. So it made it look all very democratic as opposed to military and regimented. There's a remarkable statement uh, made uh, by the military commander in charge of designing this system, and uh, I quote it in my book, and I'm, I'm going to read it again. It's so astonishing. Uh, it's, uh, it starts at the be bottom of page 133, and it's a statement by Provost Marshal General uh, Enoch Crowder, who was the, the top leader of the Army's draft apparatus. And he's describing, uh, this was actually published uh, in an Army report, the operation of the draft boards. He said they acted as buffers between the individual citizen and the federal government. And thus they attracted and diverted like local grounding wires in an electric coil such resentment or discontent as might have proved a serious obstacle to war measures had it been focused on the central authorities. Its diversion and grounding at 5,000 local points dissipated its force 
and enable the central war machine to function smoothly without the disturbance that might have been caused by the concentrated total of dissatisfaction. <laughs> that is such a, a, a perfect expression of Machiavellianism. When I read that, I thought, I can't quote this. People will think I made it up. <laughs> this man wrote this for the whole world to see. Basically saying, we've found a way to organize our coercion so that we can get away with it, although we know what we're doing. We're grinding you raw materials into our war machine. You don't want to be ground, but we're getting away with it because we've cleverly organized the grinding. It's just amazing. So you can take, by force, by trickery, and intimidation is good. And that's where all the supercharged patriotism came into play. Uh, the Wilson administration uh, organized as many uh, public opinion leaders as it could think of to try to stir everybody's emotions up. Now, <clears throat> when it comes to propaganda, I think even to this very day, the British are the masters. And in World War I, they had not only got their way ahead of us, <laughs> but they had got to the United States way ahead of us, and they had actually told our authorities how to do things. Uh, they had shown the way in propaganda. You know, it, it was the Brits who invented all these lies about German atrocities in Belgium and babies on bayonets and and all the rest of this hogwash uh, for their own purposes. Uh, but one of their purposes, of course, was to induce the United States of America to come into the war on their side, and that had been the case from the very beginning. Now, the United States had been important to Britain even early on in 1915 and 16 as a provider of raw materials. Very important. So... We were in the war, just not a belligerent in the war. And, uh, but once we did become a belligerent, uh, we had not mobilized the armed forces. Armed forces of the United States altogether. The Army and the Navy, 1916, had fewer than 200,000 personnel. Yeah. That's, that's nothing. Uh, I mean, there must have been tiny countries in Europe with bigger armies than that. I mean, I'm, I'm sure places like Bulgaria and Romania had huge armies uh, compared to that, and, and they were nothing compared to <laughs> armies of millions like the ones in Austria and Germany and France and Russia and, and even uh, Great Britain. So... So the United States was not really in a position to be a very decisive direct military force, but it was in a position all along to be a terribly decisive force in terms of munition supply. And it had already been doing that, and it, and it did that in an even bigger way in 1917 and 18. And once it did begin to build up its armed forces, as I said, it built the army up uh, from... from from about 150,000 men to 4 million men in less than two years' time. And it managed to get 2 million of those men to Europe uh, by uh, the time the war ended. And when the German general staff looked out across the water, it could see <laughs> enormous potential out there for the Americans to just keep pouring fresh, well-supplied troops onto the Western Front and that was what led the Germans to say, we must seek a settlement. So America was decisive uh, in this war, as it turned out, it, because it, it, it had the potential to be militarily decisive, uh, besides being very important in terms of supplies to the French and the British. Okay. 
when uh, the government set out to build up this big armed force, it, it had to take a uh, whole variety of actions to supply the training facilities, the, the bases, the housing, the subsistence, the equipment, the arms, the ammunition. Uh, this was a very big undertaking. Uh, for which, as I say, there had been very little prior preparation. There had been a certain amount of fumbling study <laughs> uh, about what they ought to do to organize industry for uh, war purposes uh, in 1915 and 16, but not a great deal had come of it other than uh, uh, formation of a few boards and accumulation of some information about industrial capabilities. Um, but in 1917, they had to get serious because they started appropriating billions of dollars for the Army and Navy to go out and buy goods and services. And so the purchasing agents went forth, and they started bidding things uh, away from other uh, potential uh, purchasers in the markets. Now, that began to force up prices, of course. We've got this infusion of new demand coming, coming into the market. And as that happened, then the government realized, well, <laughs> this is not good. This is going to cost a fortune. Uh, and that means we've got to raise taxes or we've got, to, we, we've got to somehow find a way to sell more bonds. So uh, we just see problems growing out of this. So what can we do to diminish the magnitude of these problems? How can we, we keep a grip on this vast mobilization effort? And uh, the government's war planners realized that, th that, that they could use controls of various sorts to, to, to interfere in the operation of the price system in a way that would hold down the government's visible costs of making war. Now remember, the true costs of making war <laughs> are whatever they are. You can't, you, you, you can't do anything about that. If certain sacrifices are being made, in order to use resources for war purposes, they're being made. Those costs are being borne, whether people know they're being borne, whether they understand them, whether they see them. Uh, nonetheless, uh, those, those costs are inevitable when you divert resources to war purposes. But for political purposes, it makes all the difference in the world how people appreciate the costs. Do they see it? Do they understand how big it is? Those kinds of things influence political action and even the viability of, of the government itself. Because it, even though there, there was a lot of, uh, uh, of approval for uh, America's initial entry into the war, uh, there was at the same time uh, uh, quite a lot of serious opposition, uh, the, and not just from radicals and socialists. They opposed, and they, they were not inconsequential in 1917 in this country, uh, uh, but, but others also uh, were, were uh, opposed, some even aghast, Remember, we've got all these millions and millions of immigrants and children of immigrants. And who are the two biggest immigrant groups? Germans. <laughs> well, most of them think this is a horrible idea to go to war against Germany. Uh, and Irish. And they would rather die than help England. So you've got the large groups of people already predisposed, not to speak of masses of people in the Midwest uh, part of the United States who had thought going to war was stupid and they couldn't see any reason to do it to begin with. Most of the war support before 1917 had been concentrated in the Northeast and much of that manufactured by rich people uh, the, in the, what Murray Rothbard would call the Morgan Ambit, uh, people of that sort. But... Uh, uh, the, the point is that the government had to take into account opposition, and it under, understood that opposition would grow uh, if it made the costs of the war too visible and made people uh, fully aware of how great they were, were and, and, and were, were going to be. So uh, 
controls offered a way to, to conceal costs and to allow the government to carry out objectives that otherwise would have been, at least financially, uh, much more visibly costly. As the, the government began to purchase a lot of munitions, a certain raw material prices rose a great deal. And uh, in some cases, it became almost impossible for manufacturers to get hold of various raw materials, at least to get hold of them at prices that made them uh, worth using anymore. And so that, that created a lot of squawk, and it, it also began to distort the structure of industry. A whole industries found that you know, they were in a bind. Uh, how can we keep operating uh, if we have to pay five times more for copper than we did before? Uh, even before the war started, uh, people engaged in international commerce had discovered that shipping rates had gone up so much that uh, it was uneconomic for them to even bring goods from places such as Australia or South Africa or South America because it, it, it cost too much to transport them. And uh, they had set up so much howl that the government had passed the Shipping Act in 1917 uh, creating a federal board, the Shipping Board, empowered to set shipping rates uh, for international shippers and other terms of service for people in that industry. Uh, it also empowered that board uh, then and even more later in amendments to the legislation to, to basically take over the whole ocean shipping industry, which eventually it did, uh, including uh, just, just confiscating <laughs> property rights over all ocean ships of more than 2,500 tons. So all but the smallest vessels were basically placed at the disposal of the government, which told the owners, and the ostensible owners, uh, uh, what they could get for their services, assigned routes, assigned cargoes. So in all but uh, formal uh, status, the ocean shipping industry was nationalized during World War I. So that, that was one way of dealing with rising costs, to just, just have the government set the, set the prices and, and they can hold them down then. It didn't mean, by the way, that the real scarcity of shipping was in any way alleviated. <laughs> it was still a fact that there were only so many ships there and that some were getting torpedoed regularly uh, and that the French and the British ocean shipping services were they're down to almost nothing because they had withdrawn their ships for their own war purposes. And the German shipping and the Austrian shipping had, had retreated into safe ports or been interned in foreign countries, so that wasn't available. So the, the, the fact of scarce shipping was just a fact of life, and all the, all the price manipulation in the world couldn't change that. Now, in a way, the government understood that too, it understood, for example, that in order to make a military impact in Europe, it had to get its army over there, and that required in itself a huge amount of shipping. So it, it decided it would just have to produce the ships, and the shipping board was authorized uh, in 1916 to create a subsidiary for the purpose of constructing and operating ships and uh, that was called the Emergency Fleet Corporation during the war and then the Merchant Fleet Corporation afterwards when it persisted and operated a government shipping line, losing money every year. So uh, they started building ships, but again, the government had only a few naval shipyards. It didn't have the capability to, to build hundreds of merchant ships. So before it could build the ships, it had to build the shipyards. So it set about doing that. And in some places, such as Hog Island near Philadelphia, it built these massive uh, shipyards. Uh, and, and, and that took time. You see, you see, I, I keep emphasizing the, the United States entered this war very late, and it's not ready. So it's got to take all these frantic efforts to do what needs to be done uh, to be an effective belligerent. So it has to build these shipyards, 
Then they start building ships. Well, almost none of these ships was actually completed uh, by the end of the war. <laughs> a lot of them were well along. <laughs> a few of them were completed, not many. <laughs> Uh, but the great bulk of them uh, didn't get finished until uh, 1919, 1920. And so there's the government stuck with a lot of uh, shoddy merchant ships for which there's really no demand at that time. Uh, it, it, it sold two-thirds of them in the 1920s at very attractive rates, basically said, here, take this ship, uh, uh, it's yours. Uh, still had about a third of what it had built in its hands, and as I say, operated those ships commercially, but at a loss, which had to be made up by Congress. So the, uh, the, the, the shipping was never really provided by the United States, and almost all the shipping services that took American troops and supplies to Europe was actually provided by British ships. British, of course, had the big merchant navy, as well as the uh, navy proper of the world at that time. So uh, I suppose there was a kind of justice there. It was really on their behalf that America was in the war to begin with, so at least they provided the ships to carry the U.S. Army to France. The War Industries Board was... Uh, created by executive order by, by Wilson uh, first, and then it was authorized by Congress later on. And it was the major uh, government agency for controlling uh, industry. In order to do that, it uh, divided itself into several dozens of so-called commodity sections. And these uh, uh, were according to product areas such as uh, leather, lumber, uh, steel, uh, non-ferrous metals, and so forth. So they, they created the, these uh, subcommittees, as it were, and they brought in businessmen. Because remember, this is, this is a very small government still, the federal government in 1917. They, they, they don't have a bunch of experts on industry as part of the bureaucracy. What do they know about how the copper industry operates? Well, approximately nothing. So how can they control the copper industry and try to divert copper away from civilian uses into military uses? How, do, how can they figure out how to conserve materials? They don't have a clue. The only people who know how to do this are people who run these industries. So they go where they have to go. Uh, they go to big businessmen. And these guys... Uh, are pretty much happy to serve. <laughs> and in fact, the historical literature on the War Industries Board, uh, the best uh, work, the leading work, is by a historian named Robert Cuff, C-U-F-F. -F. I believe the title is the War Industries Board. Uh, but Cuff and the other historians uh, have almost all concluded that the War Industries Board was a kind of businessman's conspiracy. And these guys were just serving to, uh, to cartelize and otherwise to promote the interests of their own industries and firms. Uh, I, I've actually uh, looked into this enough to conclude that, that that's not quite right. Uh, there's certainly more than a grain of truth to it, uh, but if one looks at what was actually done by the members of these government boards during the war, one sees that they... They, in a sense, took their responsibility to the government quite seriously at the expense of firms in the industry on many occasions. And uh, one of the uh, factors that has misled the, the historians who've written about these episodes is that they, they think business was much more profitable during the war than it really was and they make that mistake because they don't appreciate the extent to which the purchasing power of money fell during those years. So very often they look at what these b companies were earning before the war and they say, ah, look at how much they earned in 1918. They were making so much more once they had their pals controlling resource allocation in the industry or setting prices. Uh, but if you adjust for the inflation, 
<laughs> and you adjust for the extraordinary corporation taxes being levied. That was a major source of government revenue in World War I, corporation taxes. And not only did they have a high corporation income tax, but they had a surtax on top of it. So when you make adjustments for all of those things, you find that even in extraordinary cases, I looked at the copper industry, for example, which is often used as an example of profiteering. They weren't making more money during the war. They were making a lot less money during the war. And if, if it seems that the non-ferrous metal guys at the War Industries Board were, were working on their behalf, well, maybe they were, but they weren't doing a very good job of it because the industry was still uh, taking a big hit from the way they were compelled to do their business during the war. So, so you had this kind of uh, uh, operation going on. The War Industries Board used priorities. It assigned uh, categories like A, B, C, and even subcategories like 1A, 2A, uh, 1B, 2B, and so forth. And it devised a system whereby when people ordered industrial materials, they had to use the priority given to them by the War Industries Board and attach it to their order. So that if I wanted to buy some steel plates, for example, and I was making, oh, what, what do we say? I was, I was making uh, uh, some kind of farm equipment. Well, the, the, I would have a, an assigned priority. Maybe it was uh, 1B. And I would send my order to U.S. Steel. I want to buy this much of a certain kind of steel. And it would say 1B on my order form. And U.S. Steel was obliged by the War Industries Board to not fill my order until it had filled all the orders it had with higher priority ratings. So it was a ranking system. Now, of course, everybody wanted a high priority and so there's a lot of jockeying and lobbying, and businessmen were constantly going to Washington or calling up their pals in the commodity section to try to get their rating improved or changed, and everybody claimed to, to be critical for the war effort. And, and as a result, uh, there emerged what came to be called a priority inflation, <laughs> which is to say almost all the orders were showing up with 1A or 2A ratings, and, and there were more of them than the suppliers could fill. So they never got to anybody with a lower priority rating. They, they weren't being served at all, uh, but even all the people with the high priority ratings weren't getting served quickly. And, and so, in effect, the priority system tended to break down because of its mismanagement by the War Industries Board itself. And that created more problems. Indeed, uh, the interesting thing about uh, the economic controllers during World War I is that when the war was over, uh, they claimed to have been enormously successful. Now, the, the head of the War Industries Board was Bernard Baruch. Uh, Baruch had been a very successful uh, independent capitalist, although he was, uh, he was closely associated with... Uh, the Guggenheims and, and other very uh, important uh, capitalist interests uh, before the war. But, uh, but uh, Baruch, after heading the War Industries Board, uh, set about after the war, immediately, actually before the war ended, I would say, he set about uh, mythologizing his great contribution. And he got uh, pe people like Gro Grosvenor Clarkson and others to write books about the, the great success of economic control during World War I, of course, under the glorious leadership of Bernard Baruch and all his wisdom. And, and he managed to propagate, not only by getting these books subsidized, but by then sending out copies to libraries all over the country and by, by feeding material to uh, reporters he had close links with at major newspapers, uh, he managed to make the public believe and historians to believe for a long time that this economic management had been hugely successful. But in fact, if you go back and follow it, what you find is that it, it was a, 
a mess. It was a mess from the beginning, and even though they were able to make certain adjustments and put out certain fires, new ones would break up, because consider what they're trying to do. They're trying to allocate resources in a huge industrial economy without use of the price system. <laughs> they're trying to set aside the normal operation of the price system where millions of people with their own demands and supplies determine the conditions of all the, the prices and other, other conditions of exchanges, and they're trying to order what those uh, uh, prices and what those terms of contracts will be uh, from on top with a relative handful of experts that can't be done. Even guys who understood the workings of the copper industry didn't know what the price of copper ought to be. Nobody knows that. That's, that's something that emerges from market exchange. And when it emerges, it expresses some information that cannot be summarized in any other way. It automatically expresses the terms of trade of all the people who participate directly or indirectly in the entire market system. And there's no way to get at and agglomerate and bring together and, and compress into a piece of information a price that all of that information in any other way. No expert can know it. But they were trying to substitute their judgments and their guesses and their wishful thinking for the operation of a price system. And, and as a result, they were creating what Mises always said would come out of such planning, chaos. And in, in more than one instance, they, they owned up to how they were committing chaos. In my book, I reproduced some of the contemporary reports about how they were short on critical materials for certain uh, munitions, and they couldn't get them because if they used them there, then they wouldn't be available for some other critical munitions. Well, that sort of situation is pervasive in any normal economy. Those kinds of foul-ups would be happening everywhere all the time, but for the price system. <laughs> we, we don't know how lucky we are. Uh, those of us who have studied Austrian economics may know how lucky we are to have the price system, uh, but all the, these uh, planners and people who think they can do a better job or somehow substitute expert control for the operation of the price system don't understand exactly what it is a price system is doing. The upshot was that if this war had lasted much longer, it would have become clear to everybody what a mess was being made. So Bernard Baruch and company got out of this mess just in time. Uh, the end of the war saved them from the revelation of what a mess they were making of war planning. And the historian who, who approaches this whole experience with the knowledge of Austrian economics to guide his observations can see what they were doing and where it was leading. Uh, but people who lack that kind of uh, preparation for the study ha have missed it. Uh, so, so that was the, the upshot of the industrial planning. Now when I say this, I say they make a mess, it doesn't mean nothing was accomplished. Okay? Even the USSR did something. They made some tanks. They produced some rockets. Central planners can do something. So these guys did enough that they could walk away from it saying, look at all that we accomplished. But what no one sees is the value they sacrificed because that's not a visible thing. You can't, you can't point to it and say, look at how much it cost for them to produce the visible result they produced. And, and that allows these, uh, these planners to get away with murder, as it were, in terms of waste. Now, industry is not the only place they needed to, to deal with similar situations. Uh, in food, in, uh, in agricultural raw materials, in fuels, uh, across the board in the, in the economy, uh, the same kinds of, of problems arose. Uh, 
uh, problems of, of trying to beat the price system, to uh, rig it so that the government could steer resources in, into war purposes and away from civilian use. Uh, and the, the problems were met in different ways. In, in the case of, of food, the, the Food Administration was, was created first by executive order and then in uh, 1917 by Congress uh, under the Lever Act of that year. The Lever Act was really one of the more draconian pieces of legislation we've ever had in this country because it authorized the president and his delegate, the administrator of the Food Administration, who, who was Herbert Hoover, uh, to, to require a license of every, everybody who uh, processed or bought and sold uh, agricultural and raw commodities. Uh, so that if you were in the wholesale food business, you had to have a federal license. Uh, if you sold any agricultural inputs, seed, fertilizer, equipment, you had to have a federal license. And of course, all these licensees had, had to adhere to the conditions of the license. Uh, and, and the Food Administration was authorized to dictate not only prices and other terms of contracts, but even profits. Uh, to set limits on how much profit could be realized. Uh, they were authorized to uh, support the price of wheat at, at no less than $2 uh, per bushel, and they, they, in fact, supported it at a price of $2.20 a bushel throughout the war, uh, operating uh, the wheat market through a subsidiary, the U.S. Grain Corporation, which... Uh, manipulated the market by buying and selling grain uh, with capital provided by the taxpayers. Uh, they also uh, operated the sugar industry the same way by taking control of that and creating something called the Sugar Equalization Board, uh, which uh, with taxpayer money manipulated purchases and sales of sugar and took complete control of imported sugar. So that, among other things, they uh, they bought sugar cheap from the Cubans and resold it uh, at a higher price domestically. So they were uh, they were uh, rigging the, uh, the the sugar market, and and again, as the government had done in conscripting labor, it discovered that uh, in order to to pursue its food conservation programs, it could be most effective by creating a. A, a whole bunch of local boards. And so the Food Administration created thousands of boards uh, for counties. Every county had one for cities, states, all volunteer, manned, okay, and womaned, because some of these uh, food board uh, volunteers were women. And uh, these local tyrants, and th that's what you have to, I think, recognize they were, you know, like thousands of little Hitlers, uh, were empowered un under the Lever Act, in effect, to tell people what to eat, when to eat it, and how to eat it. And, and so uh, the uh, degree of detail of their regulations was pushed down to the level uh, uh, of declaring things like porkless Mondays and wheatless Tuesdays and and, and meatless Fridays, and, and, and besides, you know, the absurd detail, they they would switch around from month to month if they decided that well, you know, the county's kind of short on bacon this month, so we're going to baconless Wednesdays next month. Uh, and, and having set these regulations, then they would encourage everybody to spy on one another, and to report violations, and to intimidate each other. Uh, uh, a lot of this, this action in World War I is reminiscent of, of what we read about uh, China under, under Mao Zedong, where people were all spying on each other, reporting little deviations, uh, you know, carrying, checking the little red book to see if people were adhering to Maoist philosophy. Uh, Americans in 1918 were spying on one another's meals. You know? Are the Smiths having pork on Tuesday? Well, I'll report them to the authorities. Uh, not only the Food Administration, uh, but uh, the Treasury Department created a cadre uh, called the American Protective League uh, 
of some 250,000 junior G-men who actually had little make-believe badges, and they, they felt that they were empowered to go around and find slackers. That was a term that somebody cooked up for people who were, uh, most of all, evading the draft. Uh, but if not that, then just not complying with some government edict, whether it was a food regulation or anything else. And so the American Protective League would, would, would conduct what, what amounted to vigilante raids of all sorts. You know, they'd burst in on a bunch of poor damn Irish guys to find which of them hadn't shown up when called for the draft. Uh, and, and they would drag people off to the police station and uh, make these semi-citizens arrests of them. Uh, and so we, we had this kind of uh, out-of-control, uh, quasi-patriotic, semi-organized hysteria uh, loosed upon the United States of America, the so-called land of the free. And, and to go back and read about the, the United States in 1918 is, is a shocking thing. How could this happen here? How could people act like this? And uh, I, I'm not sure I have the answer. The answer seems to be that you can stir people up if you work hard. And the Wilson administration indeed worked very hard. They created a war information uh, committee, came to be known the, as the Creel Committee after its head, George Creel. And uh, they organized these artists and preachers and actors and, and uh, school teachers and anybody else they could get to, to become uh, instant patriots and to exhort congregations or classrooms or people on the street corner to obey tax laws, pay your taxes, buy bonds, conserve food, uh, plant a victory garden, blah, 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 blah. You know, there's a whole list of things the government says you should be doing, so get in gear and do it. Uh, the railroad uh, industry I talked about before uh, uh, because it had been the object of government's loving attention for decades, and as a result of the uh, Interstate Commerce Commission's actions uh, in the early 20th century, the industry had been damn near ruined by the time the war started. Now, when the, when the government mounted this huge mobilization effort, it made matters even worse by concentrating its orders for industrial materials in the northeastern part of the country. To some extent, that was inevitable because that's where most of the industry was. But it still concentrated orders there that might have been placed elsewhere. Uh, and, and that put more pressure on the railroad network in the Northeast, which is a relatively small area in any event. And so it, it, they were trying to work all of these shipments of munitions onto a, a, a limited number of uh, rail routes to bring them to just a handful of ports to be sent to Europe. So they were creating congestion that could have been avoided. Now, once again, if you didn't have government planners... <laughs> Hey, the price system takes care of this. Normally, if you're just shipping things, uh, products to Europe from somewhere in the interior, and you find there's big delays in, in shipping them via New York port, well, maybe you ship them to Philadelphia or Baltimore or, or some other place. Uh, you take care of that. Everybody makes adjustments that suit the particular conditions of time and place. But government planners make these one-size-fits-all decisions, and they say, you know, munitions type X are all going out of New York. So everybody's got to end up sending shipments over a handful of rail lines that go to New York City. So the rail lines were getting congested. They were, they were having a lot of breakdowns because they hadn't been able to maintain the capital stock of the industry uh, given the economic squeeze they'd been under for 15 years. Uh, so uh, there were problems and followed by problems getting shipments physically carried uh, from their origins in the United States to Europe. And to top it all off, uh, at the end of 1917, the weather got horrible and it snowed like crazy in the Northeast. 
And that stopped the operation of the railroads uh, from time to time in various places. So everything was grinding to a halt. And uh, the government realized this was going to wreck the whole program if they couldn't supply their army and provide their allies with supplies. And uh, they didn't see any way around it because they had tied themselves in knots. Uh, the unions were pressing for higher wages again. You know, they had pressed in 1916. And the government had intervened and, and given them a 25% pay increase by legislation, cutting the working day without cutting pay. Uh, but they came back the following year and threatened a nationwide strike again during the war. <laughs> There's patriotism for you. Uh, railroad unions saying, we can shut down the whole machine. We want more pay. And having a, a good stranglehold uh, to make that threat, uh, and once again, what's the government going to do? Send in the army to operate the railroads? They don't know how to run a railroad. <laughs> they can't do it. Uh, so what it finally did was throw up its hands and nationalize the industry in the last week of 1917. That meant, of course, that the railroad companies still operated the whole apparatus, uh, but they had to take their orders from uh, the Railroad Administration, headed by William Gibbs McAdoo, uh, President Wilson's son-in-law at that time, sometimes known as the Crown Prince. And uh, so McAdoo, among other things, uh, took care of the labor problem by just raising wages, by dictate. Uh, and he took care of his social conscience, as he understood it, by raising the wages of uh, low-wage workers more than the wages of higher-wage workers. He was very proud of that. Uh, and and uh, he proceeded to tell the railroads what they had to do in terms of uh, what railroads shipped, what cargoes where, and what the rates would be for that shipment. He raised the rates also, but not enough to make up for the increase in costs that he had engineered. So the government ran the railroads for the duration of the war, and indeed until 1920, when it uh, finally returned them to private ownership, although under very onerous new conditions, transforming them into something approximating a public utility from that time forward. Uh, they had very little discretion over how to run their businesses after 1920. Well, in many other ways, the government uh, undertook to set aside the price system and to steer resources to war purposes. Uh, my chapter in Crisis and Leviathan spells out some of them, but there are many others I didn't cover in that chapter. It's, uh, someone estimated at one time that there, there, were, there were more than 5,000 government boards, corporations, administrations, and what have you, <laughs> uh, operating at some time, some place, during the war years. And uh, so even entire books can't hope to embrace everything that was done. As I've said, much of it was delegated down to local levels, and so it would be a job just to track how each county food administration, uh, administrator uh, made his decisions from month to month. But, but we know enough about the, the main leadership and the main uh, control agencies to, to, to understand how they operated and the results they got. And uh, again, I think what hasn't been well understood is what a mess they made of it, what a mess they had to make of it. Uh, and the fact that they managed to steer some resources uh, to war purposes uh, is insufficient basis for concluding that they succeeded. We always have to say, in what sense did they succeed? Uh, when Mises said, said that a planned economy cannot work, he didn't mean you, you couldn't have a planned economy, that it was, you know, couldn't physically exist. He just meant that you couldn't have one that satisfied the condition of economic rationality <laughs> so that the resources were allocated uh, in a way that took into account costs. A planned economy has no way to know what anything costs because only market-generated prices Give us the information by which we can evaluate the cost of anything. We'll never know if we made a profit on any deal unless we have market prices to use as the basis of that calculation. So we'll never know whether we've wasted resources or not, except in a market system. 
And uh, looking at what was done in World War I, I think it's quite fair to conclude that a huge waste was, uh, was borne by the American public. So we have a few minutes for questions or comments. Yes, sir. Um, it, how surprising the American people acted there in 1978. Uh, we just could write new books on it. Just recently, with the Patriot Act, and the, uh, mm -hmm. the same spy network against the post office going to spy mm -hmm. on people. The truck drivers were going to be mm -hmm. authorized to spy on people. Yeah. Uh, I agree. I'll, I'll talk on Friday more about that. Uh, we haven't yet reached the magnitude of the situation in 1917, although in some ways the government, by virtue of using modern technology, can do even more draconian <coughs> things today than it could in 1917. Uh, in those days, the post office, when it undertook censorship, which it did, had to actually open your mail. Uh, now, of course, uh, they can have a an electronic apparatus that filters through everybody's uh, electronic mail, and we're all vulnerable. And uh, and I think they have a capability that's in, in, in a way much more powerful than they had when uh, they had to have an actual person steam open a letter or cut it open and and, and read what was inside. Uh, that did put a limit on how much they could do, and uh, to whom and where. Uh, of course, they they did grievous things to some people. Uh, Joe mentioned the other day in his talk that they 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 sentenced people to prison for ten years just for for giving speeches, which weren't even all that violently in opposition to what the government was doing. They uh, they arrested uh, Upton Sinclair and Roger Baldwin for reading the Constitution in public. Uh, so. Uh, if you if you want to really get a sense uh, sometimes of of uh, just how paranoid the government became, read the Sedition Act of 1918. Uh, uh, in fact, if you like, I, ha I have a copy uh, in my notes here of a part of it, and it, it is amazing. That law basically said that the government could arrest and imprison you for anything that they took to be a criticism of the government. Uh, or its war efforts, or its army, or its symbols, or a whole list uh, of trivial things, such as the uniform of the military forces. So, so if a soldier walked by and I said, you, you look like a damn uh, marching band leader, uh, I could be imprisoned for that statement. Well, look uh, at that guy that uh, had that movie, The Revolution, that uh, showed the British. Yes, bad. that's right. That's right. He wasn't even commenting on the U.S. government at all. If you ate bacon on Tuesday, mm -hmm. what did they give you? I mean, did they just stick your neighbors on you, or did they put you in jail? Yeah. Uh, I, I think uh, in, in cases like a violation of, 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 of food regulations, they probably just tried to shame you publicly. Or like the uh, she, those people was actually getting uh, threatening uh, Dixie Chicks. Dixie Chicks. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, the death threats the the, for the Dixie Chicks. Yeah, well, <laughs> well, there there is a what I think of as the dark side of modern technology, which uh, which I experience when I, I write uh, opinion columns and receive death threats by email myself. So <laughs> it's very cheap to send somebody a death threat nowadays, and. <laughs> <laughs> so naturally, people demand more of that. Uh, yes, sir. You mentioned, I don't believe, but I think I got it out of your book, actually. But I thought that you mentioned that in the book, I think, about 1916, um, some law that was passed on transportation that gave government control of all transportation. It was stuck in one bill. Mm -hmm. and right. Gave them control yeah. of all transportation in the United States. Well, the Army Appropriations Act of 1916 has a paragraph wedged in there, among a lot of other trivia, uh, that authorizes the president to take control of any means of transportation uh, for purposes of uh, defense uh, or, or related purposes. So this was actually the authority under which the government did take over the railroads uh, in 1917. Uh, some people have argued, including my, my old friend John Hughes, who, who wrote about that uh, provision, uh, that it was put in there by people who were uh, 
who were thinking about uh, the armies uh, dealing with uh, Mexican incursions uh, in the uh, Texas border. And, uh, Pancho Villa had come across the border once or twice in the southwest, and, and uh, U.S. Army troops had, uh, had gone to, uh, to chase him away, and, and they'd actually chased him into Mexico. Uh, and uh, while they were down there on that expedition, apparently they... They had some trouble getting railroad service <laughs> for, for their supplies, and so some members of Congress had thrown that uh, provision in to make sure that if that situation occurred again, then uh, the Army would be able to get the railroad service it needed on the spot, uh, but not by asking, but just by <laughs> demanding. Uh, that, that may be true. If it is true, though, it just shows how often something... Uh, enacted into law for one purpose turns out to serve a very different and, and, and much more consequential purpose later on. Well, that completely got that passed out of the law itself. And clearly they weren't after that because they stuck it in. I think you said they stuck it in between the uh, appropriation for building a bridge and, and something else. Yeah, something about buying mules, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, if you look at any, any big appropriations act Congress passes, uh, I've looked at a lot of the defense appropriations acts of modern times, uh, you'll find them uh, full of provisions like that, uh, things that you th think, what is this doing in here? And, uh, and they're just stuck in there by members of Congress because uh, they know that the big bill is one that's certain to, to be passed, because the major purpose is one that has great majority support. And so they know if they can stick any unrelated or distantly related provision in there, it'll be kept carried through into law uh, along with the whole body of legislation. So they've been doing that for a long time. It's become more and more common as uh, the past century has gone by. I think one recent example might be the Ray Act. Grave Act. Right. That was the law that uh, authorized the Amber Alert, mm -hmm. which is a real good idea, but mm -hmm. tucked in there someplace is the law that uh, the government can shut down any event right. where someone can even potentially use any kind of a drug. That isn't what I wanted to ask. What I wanted to ask was, what is the name of the rock fire essay again? Uh, it, it's called... Uh, World War One as fulfillment. Thank you. Matt, and you said it's in the Coastal War? Yeah, it's in the New Coastal War. Yes. Like yes. Yeah. Well, it's in the first edition, too, I believe. Joe? Yeah, I just wanted to mention, um, there was, you may know this article, but there was an article about 1922 and something like, some popular magazine, like Literary Digest or Liberty or something. I have the citation somewhere. It was about the... Um, People in uh, some place like I think it was Northwest Arkansas just sort of ignoring the draft, and they came around and draft them and just go hide with Uncle So and So and just kind of move around. Mm -hmm. So the article um, passions that a kill was sort of written more in the spirit of ridicule. I mean, you know, imagine these stupid hillbillies that didn't find the destruction of the Kaiser important to them personally. <laughs> <laughs> I wrote about this at least. There was a uh, there was a really interesting uh, little piece. Uh, on uh, Lou Rockwell's site yesterday about the British portrayals of the Kaiser. Uh, uh, maybe some of you read it. Uh, they recruited a Belgian art, uh, Dutch artist who, uh, who came up with this uh, grotesque uh, cartoon imagery of uh, Kaiser Wilhelm, uh, who, who was, uh, as you may know, the grandson of Queen Victoria. He was a not so distant relative of the, of the, the uh, House of Windsor uh, at, at the time of World War I. So as usual, you know, the European aristocrats are having wars with one another again. Uh, but uh, they, they managed to get uh, this, this, this image that made him look like a, a cross between a crocodile and a, a, some kind of a devil figure and... Uh, and th th this was then carried to the United States and, and used here, and uh, they, m they managed to make out the Kaiser as this, as this diabolical, evil figure when, 
Uh, he had relatively little to do with anything, it seems. Uh, he certainly didn't bear responsibility for atrocities of World War I. Sure, so the United States government paid off his debts to World War I. Um, well, in a sense, no, because the, uh, the debt uh, at the end of World War I had been run up from about a billion dollars, which you know, had been almost non-existent before the war. Uh, it was about $25 billion at the end of the war. And if you follow it afterwards, uh, even though it came down some in the 20s, uh, then it started back up again, and of course, ever since then, it's been going back up. So, if you think in terms of the debt being like water in a bathtub, uh, it's never been emptied <laughs> since since 1914. So. so, even after the Second World War, in the early 50s, the government we've never been free of debt at all. Oh no, 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 no. Not even close. The, uh, the, the debt incurred in World War II was huge. Uh, so the, the debt at the end of World War II was, uh, uh, was about $250 billion, as I recall. Uh, and uh, there, there were almost never any significant surpluses thereafter. So there, were, there was no paying down of debt. You know, we had a few years just recently, uh, 99, 2000, 2001, where a little bit of debt was was paid down, but it's trivial uh, compared to the size of the debt. So no, I mean basically it's only kind of gone up in stages ever since uh, 1914. Give me an idea how much a percentage of, um, of the federal of federal spending is, is paid on interest. To uh, right now, I think it's a. Uh, no, uh, I think it's about 13 percent of, of of the federal budget right now is is for interest uh, costs on the debt. I I actually have those data with me, so I can look it up. Well, we'd better uh, call a halt to this session. Thank you very much. <laughs>